that music is just so appropriate for this setting. Just like it just feels like that was perfect over here, right here, right now. But we're going to continue on with answering the call. That'll be our theme I think we'll carry on with tonight. Yeah, what just came to my mind, actually, I had the opportunity to join with a friend this afternoon and looking at very little details about, um, about just spending money and it felt like nothing and underneath that, just going deeper and deeper, it was about accepting our true worth and looking at the idea of needs in the world and the idea that we need anything that we are not whole and complete already now and that something outside of ourselves would complete us or make us happy or give us something that is not already here and now. And the invitation in joining with him was really about accepting the fullness, the fullness of our worth right now, which is totally available. And um, we don't have like most of the time, we're just not aware of those subtleties. We think that going to the movie theater, just a feeling a new movie and just a feeling of, oh yeah, that sounds great and I, I just feel so attracted by that and we move along with it. And But underneath that, there might be a call for for something deeper and just going for what we think we need and thinking we know what we need even is is often just masking something that is far beyond that and that is calling to be seen and here in this case that was about how worthy we are to receive everything not just some little things but really the whole kingdom that's what the course is saying when when he says that um, we ask for too little and that we are so worth it of so much more and i feel like the awakening path is really about that realizing that what we think we want is so valueless regarding of what we truly want and how it gives us everything that we always truly wanted, which is really peace of mind and true happiness. And it has nothing to do with any form, any relationship, any specifics in the world, because truly the world has never satisfied us, otherwise we wouldn't, wouldn't be so many being here if truly we had found satisfaction in anything in the world. And what we are talking about tonight is really opening ourselves up so wide and being ready to receive everything that God wants us to receive, which is the whole kingdom, and that is priceless. Yeah, it, it seems like when you go deeper and deeper on the spiritual journey that the ego is interpreting there's a sacrifice along the way because the ego made up the world and everything of the world. It peopled the world, it made up all the interpersonal relationships, it made up all the things, all the stuff. It made it all very familiar It's part of an amnesia that you would forget the kingdom of heaven and become so accustomed to the make-believe, the fictitious, that as soon as you've finally realized that, that this world really wasn't going to satisfy and you kind of made the turn back inward, then every step that you seem to take inward, uh, the Holy Spirit rejoices and the ego interprets, now what else do I have to give up? Um, because it's made up a world in which you seem to have things and have skills and abilities, have a body, have a bank account, have have family, you know, have relationships and so forth, and all those havings aren't real havings, they're all illusory havings. But every step inward you take on the journey is interpreted by the ego as a sacrifice. 
uh, even in the spiritual traditions, they talk about giving up something for Lent or something so forth. It's it always feels like a sacrifice because the ego is interpreting it in that way. And actually, it's just like Armel said, you're coming back into everything and you're really giving up nothing for the experience of everything. That's actually what's happening. So, when we talk about sacrifice, um, there's a part in the Course in the Teacher's Manual where Jesus is saying, that He defines sacrifice as the giving up of what you want. In heaven there's no sacrifice at all, but on earth he's describing this idea of sacrifice as the giving up of what you want. And on one hand he's saying, you have been called by God to the most holy function that there ever is. This function of forgiveness will wake you up to true happiness, eternal happiness, and, and then there's the egos, things, trinkets of the world, and Jesus is saying the sacrifice is the giving up of what you want. Are you going to sacrifice the call to go home, or will you sacrifice the trinkets? That's the choices that we have to make as we go inward, as we drop deeper into stillness, into, through meditation. Will I sacrifice my calling, or will I sacrifice the trinkets? Meaning the things of the world that were made to take the place. Will I sacrifice the idols? Or will I sacrifice the calling? And it can seem pretty strong because what you're familiar with in this world and what seems valuable and important, and you can make a list of those things that you still find really valuable, those are the idols. And the calling is, it's interpreted by the Holy Spirit as salvation, as true happiness, and it's interpreted by the ego as has this sense of um, loss, like I will lose the ones that I love, I will lose the things that I love and the abilities. Yeah, and the sense of loss is actually coming from holding back from the spirits, because truly there is no loss. So what we want to come to is really looking at the impossibility of losing anything and realizing that any sense of loss that you can experience is coming from holding back of something that you don't want to give to the spirits, a holding back of a thought, a holding back of a guidance, a holding back of taking a step, a holding back of giving. And all those holding back are actually making you fear to lose something. But if you take the, all the steps that are given and just keep just moving forward with the call of your heart, you'll come to the realization that there is no loss and there was never any loss and nothing has been lost. And that you, the only thing that has happened is that you include more and more and more and more and you keep opening your arms to just keep including, but there is never anything that is left out or left uh, behind. It's just really this impossibility of anything being not included because if we are one mind and that the world is me and I am the world and that everything is here how can it be anything outside of it and anything that could not be included so it's really not about the form and it's daring going there daring making the leap daring accepting and daring opening up to what the course is really teaching us and accepting the truth that is told in this book and and just opening up to to the depth of what it means being one mind and that we are all in this together and uh, that's because love is abstract and it's not specific and you never can find it in the specific. Uh, you can even use with the Holy Spirit the metaphor of expressing the content or the love through the form and that will just go so far and then you will go into these mystical states of mind where it suddenly dawns that it really had nothing to do with the form at all. The Course talks a lot about form and content and love is content and not form of any kind. Another line in the Course in the Beyond All Idols section says, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. So it's like an inverse relationship. The more you think you know about form, about anything in form, you lose the awareness of forgiveness. You cannot know forgiveness and form at the same time. It's an inverse relationship. So this should be 
be a, a helpful thing on the journey to start to realize if it's inverse, you really have to take the hands off the wheel. You really have to let go of this idea of form outcomes. And it applies to everything. A body, an interpersonal relationship, even a group, a community, a location, a place. Anything that you value in this world of specifics will hold you back from experiencing forgiveness. The Course says that this world is a dream and that we have dreams. All we're doing, our mind is completely occupied with dreams. Nighttime dreams, daytime dreams, daydreaming. It's, it's a lot of a preoccupation with dreaming. But the interesting thing is that Jesus says the dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is apparent. If you think you're just going to lop off the fear and the guilt and the pain and the shame, you know, you've got to realize it's all on a continuum. The dreams that you think you like can hold you back just as much as where the fear is apparent. That's why we're going into non-duality. That's why we're going into singularity. We're going into pure non-judgment because Positive judgments are just as harmful for your mind as negative judgments. Every time we hear about the power of positive thinking, you've got to be really careful of what you're getting into. Because if you think you know what's positive, then there's an opposite. This is a world of opposites. And if you think you know what's positive, then the negative comes with it. And that's so important to see as you go deeper, because that's the only way you'll come to that authentic experience. Part of what we want to talk about too tonight is, is relationships, because isn't it great to have a spirituality that addresses everything across the board, including relationships? And oftentimes when we just even use the word relationship, there'll be a picture that will come to your mind. Usually there's at least a couple bodies in there. <laughs> Nowadays it's more than that sometimes, triple, quads, groups, the whole thing. Or sometimes even if people think, I have a relationship with God, then they'll think of a body and God. Or, I have a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes I hear Christians say, I want a personal relationship with Jesus. So they got a personal self in there and the guy with the beard. You know, it's, 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 we have to let go of the idea of thinking of relationships in terms of bodies. We can't think like, we don't need to think like that anymore. We need to go higher. We need to be lifted up into the celestial realm to know what holy relationship is. And the Course says, minds are joined, bodies do not. Oh, don't you love that? Bodies do not. Bodies never join. Wow, isn't that a, an earth-shattering idea? doesn't do much for sex. Bodies never join. Minds are joined, bodies do not. He's really just pointing to this awareness again that mind is singular, there is one mind. And if you want to know who you are and you want to know who God is, you've got to get into that experience of being purely mind, purely an idea in the mind of God. And there's no other way. That's the way to know who you are, is to know yourself as an idea in the mind of God. So. How does that play out in practicalities? Well, you may think that minds are joined, bodies do not. It sounds kind of boring and, you know, like, I don't know if I want to try that. It's, it's a little too bland, you know, I like a little spice. Uh, you know, it's a little bland. Minds are joined, bodies do not. Actually, if you followed us around with a roving camera, you would see that that when we're not in stillness and silence and the words are coming forth from our mouths, that, that we're, we're always talking about the calling in some way, in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter who we're talking about, what the phone call, the Skype call is, when we're sitting around talking, it's, it's all about the call. We're so excited about the call. We have nothing else to talk about but the call. It's really exciting. You would hear, you would just, if you followed us around with like a little roving camera, a little belt cam or shoulder cam, you know, you would find that we are very joyful and happy about the call. And... <laughs> Isn't it true? Huh? She's, 
That's our life. <laughs> That's all it's about. So if it's not silence and beautiful presence, then we're talking about the call in some form. And, and really it's, if you watch this, you know, it, it might seem a little boring to the ego because there's not so much there's joy and exuberance and, and all that, but there's not the spices of what the world, the ego would call the spices of life. People have told me, the more they listen to me, the more they're afraid that heaven is really bland. Uh, and I tell you, it's not. I'm very joyful. But, but actually, uh, we're not really into trying to make things happen in the world or make things different or try to work on the form outcome. That's the last thing really in our mind. So, when we have these talks, these satsangs, these gatherings, these shatakwas, we really want the Spirit of God to just pour through and, and extend this happiness and joy. And you know, peace of mind is really no small gift. It's, it's really not a small gift to just have a constant state of peace, happiness, and joy. God's will for us is perfect happiness. The peace just extends and extends and extends. And yeah, there's really no dramas. Uh, what would seem like a drama to the world, even is a comedy in our awareness. It's, we just have a, a lot of laughter at it, just because it's a gentle laughter at, thank God this is false. You know, it's that kind of laughter. It's not laughing at anybody. It's laughing with the whole universe at the tiny mad idea and all the seeming effects of that idea.